Good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin to introduce our panelists. I'm going to start from my left, your right, with Jen Atkins. Jen is an associate professor at Florida State University, where she teaches courses in dance, history, and research. Her own research focuses on American social dance practices as they intersect with issues of gender, race, class, and power, especially in her hometown of New Orleans. Atkins <laughs> also focuses on dance and popular culture in developing pedag pedagogical approaches for fostering creative critical thinking in the classroom. She recently published a co-edited two-volume anthology with University Press of Florida, Perspectives on American Dance, the 20th Century and the New Millennium, as well as her own monograph with LSU Press, New Orleans Carnival Balls, The Secret Side of Mardi Gras, 1870 to 1920, which won the 2017 Jews and Francis Landry Award for Most Outstanding Achievement in the Field of Southern Studies by an LSU Press book. Kim DeVos DeVille is Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Xavier University of Louisiana, my alma mater, <laughs> a professor of counselor education, a psychotherapist, and psychoanalyst. Her area of research is in the use of expressive arts as a response to large group social trauma with attention to women, gender, and insurgency. Dr. Voss DeVille is the author of The Baby Dolls, Breaking the Race and Gender Barriers of the New Orleans Mardi Gras Tradition. The Baby Dolls was the 2016 selection of one book, One New Orleans, One New Orleans. In 2013, her book was the basis for an exhibition entitled They Call Me Baby Doll, a Mardi Gras Tradition at the Louisiana State Museum Presbyterian. An art exhibit guest curated by she and Ron Bachet entitled Contemporary Artists Respond to New Orleans Baby Dolls was on view in 2015 at the McKenna Museum of African American Art. Her edited work, Walking Ratty, The Baby Dolls of New Orleans is forthcoming this summer, 2018. Now we have Ms. Karen Celestan. She is an executive writer and editor in University Advancement and Adjunct Professor of English at Texas Southern University in Houston. She was Senior Program Manager for Music Rising at Tulane in the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South at Tulane University. Karen is co-author of Freedom's Dance, Social Aid and Pleasure Clubs in New Orleans with photographer Eric Waters. And give me a second so we can pull up Mr. Waters. Mr. Waters is a distinguished photographer. If you do not know that, I am pulling it up. Give me one second here. Where it disappeared to on these devices, you never know. But just give me a second. Here it is. It suddenly reappeared. All right, Mr. Waters. Mr. Waters has been a professional photographer for more than 30 years. He studied under the tutelage of the late Marion Park Porter, a very well-known and respected black New Orleans photographer and owner of Porter's Photo News. Through his relationship with Marion Porter, Porter, P-O-R-T-E-R, -E that's a distinguished historical name we all need to know, he was taught to really see the world around him in a way that he had never known before. It was this relationship that built the foundation for Waters' future in, photographer, in photography. We're go, gonna go on. His work has appeared on CD covers for jazz artists such as Bob French, Victor Goins, Juanita Brooks, and Smokey, Rock, Smokey Johnson. His work has also appeared in local and national magazines, newspapers, brochures, and showbills. He was the lead photographer for projects like Ties That Bond, an, ex an ex exhibition and catalog sponsored by the Casey Foundation, Great Day in New Orleans, a group photo capturing 283 New Orleans African American artists of all images. So in 2005, Waters lost his home and the majority of his life's work in Hurricane Katrina, but it has not deterred him, thank you, and his desire to continue the documentation of the culture. So with that, we're going to start with Ms. Atkins, and I'd like her to begin 
telling you a little bit about her work. My work uh, has a very broad conception about dance and looks at the interactions between dance and history. I grew up here as a mover and trained in a lot of different dance forms. And I became very engaged in the city's history itself. I mean, being from New Orleans, we're always obsessed with New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans. And I, as a part of Mardi Gras, really began to see how Mardi Gras is a moving history at every point. We are always physically embodying our culture, not just in Mardi Gras, but in the streets very vividly. We are always moving what it means to be a New Orleanian. So when I began to, um, to get my PhD and had to figure out, what am I gonna do for my dissertation? What am I gonna do for my dissertation? I looked to myself and asked myself, what did it mean to what did my world view, what does it mean to move every day? And I looked here to New Orleans and figured out that there were a lot of glossy histories about the city and a lot of glossy histories about our history. And so I began to unpack or decode what it meant to look at New Orleans history through the body. And one of the glossiest histories that we have is about the old line crews in Mardi Gras, especially from the Civil War to World War I. And it's fascinating because the most secretive part of the old line crews, which is Comus and Proteus and Momus, Rex, and the original Twelfth Night Revelers, the most secretive part that they have are their carnival balls, which are for themselves and um, they're, they invite each other to balls that happen at the end of their parades. And this is where, through dance and other movement practices, they really lay out for each other what their world views are and what they think about what's going on in history at that moment on the macro level in United States history on a national scene, but also at a local scene. And we see that through their bodies. And so that's what my work does. It looks at how the body in motion in socially choreographed ways, but also in formally choreographed ways, how the body in motion reveals what it is that we're doing here and what it is that it means to be here. Thank you. Dr. Zapatos, did you read? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, ha I, I just want to um, let you guys know that I, I have connections with the two books that um, are recently published and, are, and that we're celebrating. Uh, I, I was given the, the honor, we're all from LSU Press, and so I was given the honor of writing, being asked uh, to write uh, my thoughts that appear on the back jacket of Jennifer's book. And I'm gonna look that up because I just wanted to read that to you. Um, I, I found her work um, not only uncovering necessary history, but I found that her conceptual modeling is a way to also think about or could be used to think about how we can dance from a perspective, how we can use dance from, the, from insurgency. Hers focuses a lot on how privileged people have used dance to reinscribe these notions of power. My work, and also um, Karen and Eric's work, looks at the subaltern voice and how we use these traditions from, from our own history um, to empower ourselves in one of, the, one of the venues that's most accessible, and that is the public street. So I also had the, the privilege and pleasure, they don't know this, but I'm sort of telling them now, of reviewing their book before it was published. <laughs> and they didn't know that. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed, I, en I really enjoyed being able to go through that history. And um, also learning about, uh, I mean, it just, you know, it just, it was really rich and, um, you know, it has fed my work because I was also at the same time working on Walking Ratty, The Baby Dolls of New Orleans which is a book that Jennifer is a contributor to and will be out this summer. 
And I'm always selling something. I'm always promoting something. So I'm selling not necessarily the book, but the book launch. So the book launch is gonna be a fundraiser for One Book, One New Orleans, and I'm inviting all the baby dolls to come and play, and all of you to come back in sometime in the summer and play with us, celebrate, and celebrate literacy. So, um, that, so, so this book, the first book that I did focused on history, and this book rec you know, is a reclamation, once again, of that history through various uh, scholarly, uh, scholars, scholars like uh, Jennifer, and, um, but it also is a testimonial with rich embodied lived experiences from people who've known the baby dolls. And then because nothing worth, nothing, uh, every, anything that's worth doing is worth overdoing for me, I included all of the artist statements and all of the artwork, and they're gonna put them in color uh, in the book. And so this is a living manifestation, this book of how uh, the baby dolls have affected the art community the contemporary movement, how since 2013 in the exhibit, how there's been a resurgence, a redefinition, and a redefining. And so that is the nature of the forthcoming work. Good morning. Um, I'm here to talk with Eric um, about our new work, Freedom's Dance, Social Aid and Pleasure Clubs in New Orleans. And it is one of the most African retentive cultures in the United States. Uh, because New Orleans was a slave port, many of the tribes that were taken from the west coast of Africa came directly here, and they were able to retain many parts of their culture. So what you see in the street, in the, in the public, also we call them public-private parades because they are private clubs, but they display their art in a public manner on a public street, because that is the only venue with which they could do that just like Dr. DeVille said. So it's important to note that there are 50 clubs in the city and they parade from August until the following June, usually on Saturdays and mostly on Sundays, but mostly Saturdays, Sundays, yeah. mostly on Sundays, but some Saturdays when they run out of Sundays naturally. So um, it is something to be a part of. It is sort of open to the public, but yet there is a, a very specific ritual that is involved that we detail in the book and it is important for people to know that just like a carnival ball or even in the baby dolls, there's certain lines that should not be crossed. And when you see the clubs in the street, it's important not to get in the middle of that club because they are doing a very specific dance movement and a very dis uh, specific display or in front of the band for that matter because that music is critical to the dance movement. And all of the movement that you see in the second line, the footwork, um, sometimes they're flipping, it, it doesn't matter, they're moving with the music, but it is directly tied to tribal dance in Africa, particularly the Wolof, the Ibu, the Mandinka tribes, the Congo, and those are the tribes that, uh, the Fulani, those are the tribes that came mostly from the west coast of Africa and those are the movements that you see in New Orleans and we detail in the book. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Eric and allow him to talk a little bit about the importance and the difficulty and the genius that he has in photographing dance and movement. Quite an introduction. <laughs> um, well, what the book serves to do is to have people, not only in New Orleans, but the rest of the country recognize this culture and then, like Karen said, it's one of the uh, two African retentive cultures in the contiguous United States, the other being the uh, Gullah culture off the coast of uh, South Carolina, mm -hmm. Georgia, and Florida. Having said that, uh, the culture here in New Orleans dates back to maybe the early 18, 18, uh, middle 1800s to uh, present. Um, the importance in this book is not only that does it give a historical context, also, but the pictures give you visual presence. Um, I remember I always used this uh, quote from Alice Marcellus when I was doing, uh, along with other photographers, to do the uh, Great Day in, in New Orleans photo of uh, 283 African American artists of all genres. And he was on radio trying to get everybody to come out and have them understand the importance of this photo, and he said, this will serve as us not being a rumor. We will have a presence, we will have 
something that shows that we were here. And this is what this book does. It shows that we were here, we're still here, and we're going to be here. So um, and this, she was talking about dance, but uh, this here represents uh, some of the dance that is done in New Orleans. And this guy is doing this 19 years difference. Between the two photos. Same He's guy, a young man. 19 in, years difference. And then a uh, grown man or an adult. In the, and, do, and actually, in the second photo, if, it, it might be hard to see, but you're welcome to come up and see when we're done. He's actually touching his toes, and he's an, 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 an adult male, but he was touching his ankles when he was younger, but he's much more fluid now that he's older, and he can just touch his toes. Incredible. And the, the uh, first photograph when he's younger was featured in the opening montage of Treme on HBO. Also understand that, uh, think about yourself. What can you do now that you did 19 years ago? Right. <laughs> and this is what he's doing. Incredible talent. Okay, I'm going to ask our panelists a question. It may sound basic, but I'd like each one of them to tell us their definition of dance. <laughs> because all of you have a definition of dance. I'll go first. I think it is an expression of your inner core, an expression of your inner being. And I think sometimes people get hung up on, I can't dance like someone else. So no, I can't jump in the air and touch my toes like Oliver Hunter. Um, but when I do dance, I'm expressing the core of me. And so when we all dance, and we should dance, um, this attitude that people have that we can't dance is based upon concern about external people looking at you and what and are you doing it right? But dance is an expression of self and, and spirit. And you will find that being able to dance is a very freeing thing. The movement of your body, our bodies are designed to move. And so I think dance is an expression of that movement. She took my word. <laughs> my, my definition is spirit release. And as she say, everybody can dance, but I'm a an exception to that. No, see, don't start. <laughs> I keep my spirit in. I can't, I can't dance. I would love to be able to dance, but I can't dance. I used to dance, but I can't dance anymore because I have a total knee replacement. And the doctor gave me instruction not to dance. The upper part of the body. <laughs> yeah, I can sit and dance. Here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I want all of you to think about it. In New Orleans, Black, white, rich, poor, educated, uneducated. When we walk down the street, we dance. Mm -hmm. And I know you see it. Mm -hmm. I know you, you see it in your family. When that uncle comes in, mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it over to our mm -hmm. definition of dance. I think that dance is a bodily movement in space through time that inherently carries meaning. Mm -hmm. So that it can be improvisational, it can be predetermined, it can be a, a meaning that is aesthetic and purposefully aesthetic, or it can be meaning that is um, outside of or within yourself. So what I mean by this is that I do see walking as dance. So pedestrian movement that is sympathetic to our way of understanding the most natural and fundamental ways of locomotion is dance. Because what it does is it carries meaning with us. We all move in our own way. Like even the way I'm sitting in this chair, even the way that I'm gesticulating, mm -hmm. carries with it a lot of meaning already about who I am as Jen. It has a lot of information right now. You can tell who I am as a person, where I've come from, what my ideas about myself and the world are. And we can read body language as a social choreography as dance, and it is. Mm -hmm. So I have a very broad 
definition of dance. And what that does is, I hope, is that it garners inclusivity mm -hmm. so that there isn't, um, even having trained in ballet and contemporary and jazz and tap and West African forms, I don't see dance like this, but rather like this. I don't even see it like this. I see it dance forms in a, in a circle so that whatever dance form it is, is in a circle where energy is shared in the middle and everyone is invited into this democratic space to share their own experiences. Okay, uh, so um, for me, dance is the people's therapy. And um, if you experience this with the collective, uh, for example, Monday night, uh, Victor Harris was celebrated, a well-known black masking Indian of exquisite talent. And so to celebrate the research that had been done on uh, he and his uh, tribe and their giftedness in terms of the arts, there was a, a second line parade. And um, it is a time when they come together, when people in the culture bearing community come together and they mask. And so they may be working at jobs that uh, are soul murdering in some cases. They can come and they have this uh, identity and release that is available in a community of accepting people. Um, I also want to mention that our dance here as therapy uh, br brings the other, even the other within African American commu communities into the center. People who would be left out of dance, especially in wheelchairs, for example, are part of our second line yes. Um, yes. Uh, groups and also the baby dolls. Ann Mays is a baby doll, really always elegantly attired, and she can tear up her wheelchair mm -hmm. in a second line. And uh, so it is the people's therapy, it's inclusive, and it is also revitalizing in the sense that play is the transitional space mm -hmm. in which there is no judge. Mm -hmm. And it is that space between reality and fantasy, but in it is the embodied area where adults can go, be in whatever attire that they create for themselves and have an accepting experience. And in many ways, those are corrective experiences from, as for what they experience in the world. So that's how I see this particular gift of dance in our community. That's really important to note because that is um, something that my students and I, for instance, talk about a lot, that uh, a variety of mobile bodies dance. And that um, the, my students, for instance, are highly mobile, highly mobile, but they are also coming from a very privileged terrain of, say, European techniques. And so it's important for us to continually talk about what does it mean if you're doing ballet and contemporary dance techniques to ask yourself what, you know, what does that mean? If your leg is up here, that's only one way that a leg goes, right? So, Definitely. Um, but, but where I am at Florida State University, we have a lot of artists and a lot of community engagement projects where they're only one kind of body among many, many kinds of bodies, which I really, and they really deeply appreciate. So. I, it's really important to, to say out loud that as many ways of dancing as there are, there is as many kinds of bodies that dance. Because I think this is also that a priori notion that dance means one thing. And that means one person is a dancer. Or there's one space to dance in. And, and there isn't and there aren't. So the next question, I'm sorry. No, uh, therein lies what people have expressed up here, 
therein lies the title of the book. It's called Freedom's Dance. And when I first saw the second line and subsequent years, that's what I see. I see it. people free in the moment, free to do and express themselves as they want to in that particular time and space. So moving along, Eric talked about it, and Mr. Waters talked about it in his introduction. The books address the subject of dance and dancers, but we'd like to know your inspiration <laughs> for creating this work. Why dance? Why a book on your subjects? Anyone? Well, the second line is, uh, is throughout New Orleans culture. Everybody has a second line for everything, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, it's become more prominent now. Uh, they had a second line for jo uh, Tom Benson the other yesterday. day. Yesterday. And, uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. And um, you see people having second line performances for everything, graduations, bar mitzvahs, birthday parties, everything. And um, in a sense, that is a way of keeping the culture alive. Uh, I have doubts in terms of how it's being kept alive, but it's here now, and the book says it's here and will be here. Yes, I, I agree with Eric. It, it, it's just important. It's, it, there's nothing wrong with people taking the culture and utilizing it in their own cultural setting. But it's important for people to know from whence it came. Uh, we were at uh, the U.S. Mint on Friday, and a woman came up to us and told us when she buried her daughter, they had a second line. But they didn't understand the purpose or what it meant. And she said after uh, talking with us and hearing about our little discussion at the Mint, she said, oh, I get it now. And, and in many respects, especially when you go back to antiquity, and many of the people who were enslaved, the belief was simply that dance and honoring your deceased person was a release. You were releasing that spirit back to God and the ancestors. So that was a method of joy that here on this plane of earth, we are just here temporarily. And that if you, you believe in everlasting life, your spirit lives forever. So when that person dies, that person goes back to God and the ancestors, hence the term freedom's dance. It is releasing that person and it is the joy. You know you are sad because you won't see that person in this plane, but you know you will see them again. And she was very moved by that. And she said she did it and not fully understanding. I said, well then that was your spirit telling you to do that without even knowing. So that is the, the beauty and the humanity of, uh, of dance culture, especially in New Orleans. Okay. Um, so um, I um, accidentally beca became someone who is uh, <laughs> speaking about dance today. Uh, I did take dance from uh, Trurier School of Dance in New Orleans and uh, Miss Durbin. Durden. Durden. And um, uh, Jefferson, Deidre Jefferson. So I, I, I danced. Yes, you did. I did dance. And um, so this is like a parenthetical remark, but I just, this is, you know, just want to say that w uh, women in New Orleans have, black women in New Orleans have had access to entrepreneurial um, occupations, and dance is a preeminent one. Through the history of segregation to today, there women could black women could form these schools, teach large numbers of students, and engage in a kind of and have students have a pageantry in which their bodies, which aren't normative European bodies, are celebrated. And so I have had the experience of dancing um, with these women uh, in New Orleans. Um, my Research started because I was um, in, uh, an, in, a, in a university situation in which the, the Great Recession wanted to merge the departments that we were in, and I just didn't think that that was a good idea, basically. And I did not want to give up the area I was in, women's studies. And so I thought about if we weren't going to be able to have these counter-hegemonic discourses with support in university settings, where were they happening? And then I remember I was from New Orleans, and they happen on the street, and they happen with 
with people coming out and with their friends and saying, we're going to make a statement. We're going to be visible. And so I started this by looking at what are those traditions. And then the baby dolls just took over and captivated me. And I've been ca held captive ever since <laughs> by this tradition. But what I have learned <clears throat> in the midst of spending a lot of time with women who mask is, and, and so what they do <clears throat> now is on, each month they have birthday parties for the baby dolls, like August or whatever, or September or whatever, and so you go. And they dance together, you know? I mean, whatever, whatever you, what, however you move. And they dance together. And to be free to be able to do that. And then I've also second line with them down the street. And to be free to be part of that, to forget everything and be in the middle of the street and dance. And so it, that's what, you know, I got started not because I wanted to dance, but where I have ended up is with an appreciation of my own body, an appreciation of black women's aging bodies and the beauty, because women who are 80 and 90 are still in the baby doll tradition. You can find them bouncing, you know? And that's a good thing. Um, and, um, and so I uh, feel that uh, this is a remarkable gift that they give um, to women everywhere. Originally, my focus was not on the old line crews, the uh, first Mardi Gras crews that were um, <coughs> northern transplants, mostly Protestant white men who moved here in the 1830s through 50s and then borrowed very freely from European Creole cultural traditions and Southern traditions that were stereotypes and then merged them with their Northern practices. This was not where my research interests lay. It was in African-American dance legacies in the streets. But I kept encountering this um, I kept encountering that the crews kept intersecting with and uh, fighting against and reacting to a lot of dance practices and that there was this, react, this yeah, reaction. And I was wondering, what's that rub? Or, or as a scholar Kathleen Brown, historian Kathleen Brown would say, what's this anxious patriarchy thing that's going on? <laughs> and so I started to follow those leads in the, in the modernization of Mardi Gras, according to the old line crews, there's this triumvirate of masking, parading, and carnival balls. But the carnival balls part was really secret. And I thought, ooh, ooh, what's going on there? And that the carnival balls had to do almost entirely with dance, I thought, now this is interesting. There are so many histories about Mardi Gras, and there's so much about the parade, so much about the costumes, and then whoop, carnival balls. And I thought, there's my in. Maybe this is where we can see what is it that the old line cruise men were trying to accomplish, and they're rubbing up against the government, and they're rubbing up against this radical Republican experiment that was here and nowhere else in the country that they oust, you know? What's going on here that's really important in New Orleans history as this model in so many different ways that the old line cruise men are doing this with? So I, I looked to the balls and realized that at every step of the way, there are these tableau choreographies that open the ball, and then these grand marches where these mock kings and queens, or gods and queens and debutantes, are hearkening to European monarchies. And then there's quadrilles and almost minuet-like and general dancing. And, I, and it, it dawned on me that they were scripting their bodies in these ways where they were trying to figure out how to adapt to, how to, adapt to the world around them. And, mm -hmm. and they found a way. And ironically, I don't know if they realized this or not, it was by embracing ragtime. <clears throat> So, and that's so, how I came to it. So let me ask you this, moving forward, we talked about your inspirations, but in your work, can you briefly, because I have two other questions that I want to ask, and it might be a little hard hitting, so let's do this one now. 
Can you talk about your questions of limitation in your work? For instance, you talked about the carnival balls, you talk about a specific period, you talk about a particular group. So at some point you had to stop, and I learned this from Dr. DeVille, and she said, you gotta know when to put the period at the end of the <laughs> sentence, right? So a little bit, just briefly, because we're almost running out of time and I'd like the audience to ask questions. What were your questions of limitation in your work? When did you know I need to just do this? I need to only focus on this. It's a good question. Um, the limitations I face now shooting the second lines in the street is cell phones and iPads. Um, that's the only limitation in terms of a period I think it's incumbent upon me to not yet put a period at the end of the sentence because it's happening every day and I want to be able to capture the changes from when I first started shooting 30, 35 years ago to now. And uh, dealing with the limitations, uh, I challenge myself to try to capture as, with as much respect as I can the, the second line and the associated and pleasure clubs. Yeah, the limitation in terms of writing the book, um, well, with any published work, you have a word count. So that was our limitation. Because <laughs> the, the book was already 248 pages. We probably could have easily had another 50 or 75. Um, because we do cover the history, the complete history of it from uh, as far back as we were able to find with our research and with our researchers. So that's the only period that we had was the word count. But what we did is try to squeeze in as many aspects of the culture as we could and talk to as many culture bearers. We had interviews. Um, there were many more that we could have had, naturally, so that is another period. Um, but what we tried to do is do a broad scope look at the culture so that there is a complete understanding of how it exists, how it came to be, and why it continues to exist and thrive today. Um, because the, we call them culture bearers, the people who are in these clubs, or many of them are working class people. Uh, they are not wealthy or, by, or, or of privilege by any means. But there is a dedication to task, a dedication to culture and to ancestry, and that is what drives them and, and helps them to find a way out of no way to make those parades happen each year. Because those clubs have to pool their limited resources, they have to buy permits, they have to pay for police protection, which uh, they are also overcharged in many respects um, by the city. But they do it anyway, They, it, even if it goes up every year, they find a way to make it happen. So that is uh, a period on them, but they manage to leap over the period and make it happen anyway. I just want to say that um, it's not easy to get out on the streets. To get out on the street in your attire is a feat. All manner of things go wrong. All manner of the, you know, the dressmaker didn't get it right, or the dressmaker's complaining you didn't get it to us on time, or you know, you don't have enough money for all your feathers, or uh, you get mad at somebody and your spirit goes, you know, goes away. And so what you're looking at when you're seeing this, it looks like joy, but this is a major task and a major undertaking. And so people should be congratulated when they manage to get out on the street. It is not easy and it is never a foregone, con foregone conclusion. And I just wanted to add that because I just want you guys to know how much work, sweat, and commitment goes into to these things. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. DeVille, because the Social Aid and Pleasure Clubs, they have a set time each year. They parade on a specific Saturday or a specific Sunday. And then if it rains, it storms, a hurricane comes, all the money they spent may or may not go to waste. But then at the same time, if they are able to parade, they are elated that it, they were able to make it happen. And they don't wear the same thing every year. So, that, so all you take, it takes literally 11 months of hardcore planning to get that 
to happen for this man to appear with his club as he did and they are all in the same hue so as my mom says that's a lot of bolts of fabric <laughs> of the same hue to be out there with the feathers matching and everything matching it's it is a major feat it really it is, is a major feat yes touched on the limitations, making sure that I focused on my main subject when sometimes I, I did want to extend the conversation into the baby dolls and Mardi Gras Indians, but needing to, to keep the focus on the crews themselves for the clarity of my argument. But also with Katrina, a lot of materials had to be frozen and then shipped up north. And so as a historian, your first job is to, to be as objective as possible and to, in, in the telling of history, um, to present materials, but then what if there are no materials for a while? Mm -hmm. So navigating that physical terrain of sources became a, a question mark at times. Mm -hmm. My, my limitation for the first um, b book on the baby dolls was I hadn't started off planning to write on a, a book on the baby dolls. But when um, we approached the presbyter and the historian said, yes, we'd love to have an exhibit, um, we were still trying to figure out, Melissa White and I, who has a New Orleans, heads the New Orleans Society of Dance Baby Doll Ladies, we were trying to figure out what the baby dolls are, <laughs> like historically. What is this? Because everybody had a different story about what a baby doll was. And so eventually, I realized that it really depended on A, what year you were living, B, what area of town you were living in, um, to determine who was a baby doll. It could be all men. It could be people from Storyville. It could be some Creole old ladies. It could be, I love it because they're the perfect postmodern subject. They just shift and change. <laughs> um, but. But my um, limitation was I needed to get this out before the exhibit opened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, and I was teaching full time. Yeah. And so, you know, I was really rushed. And so I left out a lot of stuff, which gave rise to a second book, because then I was like, oh, I've learned so much now. But I also had always wanted to invite other scholars into the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so that is the impetus. I mean, it was, the, it was a limitation, time, and space and then the, the desire to create in, 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 in collaboration with my colleagues. So this has been very hard for me because this is their panel. I have to listen, right? I have to prompt them and, and ask them questions. There's another side of my brain. And so this is the question I wanna ask them. They've been involved in this, they've researched, they've asked, they've whatever. We know people are here who they're not from here, they're born, or maybe even some people who are here who were born and raised here, and we're trying to get that notoriety, or we're trying to get that next grant. And so we got to think of something. You're not an Indian. Girl, you're not an Indian. Sit down. You can't get in that club. Sit down. So, oh, I have my new project, and I'm going to codify Second Line. So my question to you is, what? your book is your book. You own the copyright to it, the blah, blah, blah. But who now owns the dance? We have these new people jumping in the middle of the second lines and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. We have these young black people saying, I'm codifying second line. And who owns that? Can you, would you just comment on that? And then we're gonna yeah, turn that over because I'm going, I wanna, I wanna sit in that court. I wanna <laughs> sit in that court and somebody, to, I, I wanna sit there. It's yeah. It's it's owned by the people who are in the second line. It's owned by African Americans. Um, a friend of mine told me he said, jokingly, white folks can second line too, but they can't. <laughs> um, they have to face that. Now they are letting their spirit <laughs> release. They are dancing. They're doing what they're doing, but they're not second lining. Uh, give me, let me give you an example uh, in terms of a black dance troupe. Whenever somebody of note comes to New Orleans, they would have a uh, second line meet them at the airport. The Dance Theater of Harlem was coming, so they had a second line band to greet them. We all know the Dance Theater of Harlem can dance, but they can't second line. <laughs> they tried, they had the rhythm, 
but they didn't have the movement, okay? And um, you can replicate, but if you're gonna replicate, then you're not the original, okay? And uh, that's what I see, and there's a conundrum also is that everybody in New Orleans, black, white, whatever, Hispanic, se Hispanic yeah. they second, I mean, they have a second line in celebration. Mm -hmm. So why would you try to find, not only, f not find, but have people pay an enormous fee to hit the streets, and then you, I, I think I have it right, that Rex is grandfather them, and they pay nowhere near what the se second line groups have to pay mm -hmm. to hit the streets. So if you're celebrating something and you, you use something in every aspect of celebration in the city, then why are you, uh, why are you, I don't know, why do you keep these people from doing what they need to do and you put a price on it, a high price, and you limit them? Mm -hmm. So, but it's New Orleans. Yeah, I think a lot of times when you see PR materials, especially for those of you who are out of town, um, you will see Mardi Gras Indians, which is not this subject matter, or the members of the Social Aid and Pleasure Clubs displayed in a lot of the New Orleans material that goes out of town. And it does speak specifically to New Orleans because it, it does take place only here. Um, but as far as, and, and that is the issue because it is a public ritual that is also private. And unfortunately, there is a tendency to try to exploit it for, um, for public gain um, by the, the city and, and the state. Uh, because when people see it, they immediately identify, oh, that's New Orleans. Even if you've never been here, you know that without ever being here. So it, it, so it is a struggle that we are engaged in, and we hope that this project will um, create a greater understanding of what it is, that it is not just people gathering willy-nilly and jumping into the street. There is a specific ritual. It has a definite history. It has a definite place and time. It has a definite spirit. And you have people who were born and raised here who cannot second line. That is, that is a definite. Um, but there are people who have moved here from away, uh, including myself. My parents were born and raised here. Uh, my great uncle was a band leader, Oscar Papa Sullivan, but I can second line, and I'm proud of that. But my brother, who was born away, and our parent came from the same parents, he cannot. So it's something that is a spirit, that is in your spirit, that feels that you feel, and that it comes out, and that's what you engage in. So yes, you can second line, but you, I think you should have an understanding of it so that when you do see one, you know what to do. You can join in, but there are certain spaces that you don't cross and certain boundaries. So the so social aid and pleasure clubs have taken to getting people who are affiliated with them to have a rope line, as they call it. And you see people walking alongside them with the ropes so that so people don't jump into the middle of the club and not allow them to do their specific dance rituals and movements but that they're are prescribed. But they for social change. They are, absolutely. But at the same time, yeah, I know you're being facetious. But <laughs> it's a whole nother but discussion. It yeah, is, like but, but, you, but, you, but the second line is to be on the sidewalk. You are the second line to the club and the band. And so you respect that boundary. And, and I'll tell you a brief story. Um, even though I, I lived here for 40 years, um, Wanda Ruzan, uh, we were, there was a second line for one of the Humphrey brothers. And I got in the moment, dancing, and, got, and she was the grand marshal. So she was essentially leading the funeral procession second line. And I got in front of her. I wasn't paying attention. And I felt this tap on my back. It was very gentle, like that. But I was in it, so I was like, oh, I wonder who's touching me. And I'm just dancing, I'm going up the street. And then the next thing I felt was, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm gonna hit an attitude now. Who is this? And I'm like, oh. I realized where I was. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Let me get on the sidewalk. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So it happens, yeah. you know. So you could you could speak to that a little bit too. Oh Lord. All right. So <laughs> yes. And then I have a question. Yes. I have a question. <laughs> um, so the, we have a dilemma in there's I, I you know I am not a baby doll. I. 
But I, gosh. But they, I saw you dressed as one. I did too. It okay. was so beautiful. All right. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a baby doll. I am not a baby doll. Because I'm a researcher and I'm not an entertainer. But I do have baby doll outfits because Miss Mercedes Stevenson, who was the third queen in Wild Child Petulis when it fo- was founded, had been a baby doll. And for the exhibit, I wanted us to have a bona fide dress from that period since everybody lost everything in Katrina. So, so Miss Mer- Mercedes took us to her dressmaker and we all got baby doll dresses. And so I have a baby doll dress. And then I was doing participant observation for the research. And so, but I am not a baby doll, but I am always there. I'm like the biggest baby doll supporter. I take all the pictures of everything that's going on, even though I'm point and click. But we do have a dilemma. And we have a dilemma with the, with the women who are white who are ma- masking and the women who are black. We have the women who were white who were masking pre-Katrina, uh, no, a, a little pre-Katrina with Antoinette Cato. Cato and, then that, and then we have a white group that still continues to mask who finally, after trying, are finally being integrated. And then we have other groups who've never been integrated. And there, it, it's an issue. It's an issue. I can't say that it's all been worked out, but but there are white women who feel an access to the culture because they were invited in by people like Antoinette, Antoinette Cato and other culture bearers, and they say, we were let in, we're not appropriating. But that's still not a satisfactory answer to other people who don't feel that way and ask them to help and participate in a different way. This is an ongoing dilemma that is contentious. But I do have a question for our moderator. Um, Moderator, can you tell us about your dance history? Yes, please do. (laughs) It's gonna take a while, we have 10 minutes. I'd like Ms. Atkins to answer and then I'm gonna leave you some time for you to ask questions. I do have a dance history. I think that I'm privileged because, and I'm privileged because not only do I know the historical side, but I know it as an active participant, as a dancer. And then I know it from another side. When I talked about who owns it, there's an issue with people saying, well, now I'm I'm owning this. I'm going to codify this. And this is going to, how? I need you to just flip over or read the footnote about what our traditional culture is. But you can't tell them because then, you know, they're the new, they're the young people, they know better. And then they're friends with somebody who has access to grant money. See, it gets too much. It's too much. We need to keep it simple. And we just keep it simple. I'm gonna be quiet. Thank you. (laughs) What What am I answering now? Keep it real. (laughs) Yeah. You're you're answering uh, who owns the dance. Who owns, which dance are we talking about? The dance that you've researched, or just in general, New Orleans, traditional New Orleans dance. There are so many traditional New Orleans dances. Um, and what is, you know, in yeah. your mind, what, what does ownership mean? Because I can make a comment uh, uh, regarding the question Dr. DeVille asked me about the white baby dolls and the black baby dolls and compare it, but I'll wait. I'll be an audience member for that. Yeah, that, I think, needs a whole panel. <laughs> or five, as well as the one about second lines, and the, yes, and um, authenticity is also a very complicated and I think um, troubled term for me, and ownership as well. But when it comes to when it comes to the carnival balls and ownership, that is a question that I think the crews would. Ownership is something they're constantly performing in their body. I mean, I think that's what the entire book is about, is performing ownership. But once you get to, say, the, the 19 teens and the, and the end of the progressive era and into ragtime dance, the idea of ownership in, in ballroom dancing, especially with the one step, becomes much more flexible. And I think that's where at least my book ends is that um, ownership through dancing begins to open up, and that's when the crews themselves begin to be more flexible ideologically and physically Mm -hmm. and move in a little bit more sync with the world around them. It becomes problematic, though, because that's 
when they've appropriated some of the African American movement aesthetics in order to get to that place via ragtime one step, but it's through uh, Vernon and Irene Castle's version mm -hmm. of the one step. So of course it's through gentility and the kind of dance aesthetics that would be more accessible that a lot of people are accessing instead of the turkey trot that's so close and steamy, it's going to be more appropriate to their standards of what works for them. But not to be underestimated that it is still a form of appropriation. But it does create some flexibility in the way that they can find ownership and come to terms with um, this-ness. I'd, li mm -hmm. I'd like to take questions from the audience. We really are out of time, Ooh. and I think we can take <laughs> wow. here. Here we Right here. I just have a quick question. We're not from New Orleans. Can you explain the baby dolls? Oh, oh yeah. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. Get ready. Get your, get your. All right. Uh, so so the, the baby dolls uh, are a group. Uh, so we have black, several black masking traditions, and so the baby dolls have to be seen within those masking traditions. We have the Mardi Gras Indians. Perhaps we've seen pictures of highly ornate costumes, suits called suits. And then we have the skeletons, which come out of the cemetery in the morning, and they're really the first out on, um, on Mardi Gras Day to announce that this is a time for you to enjoy, but also to remember that you need to have a moral code in your own life, because otherwise you're going to be next. Um, and then we have um, the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club, which was one of the few actual parading clubs. These other two that I mentioned are walking groups. And then we have a group of people called the Baby Dolls. And so the, the, it's a folkloric tradition in the sense of we don't know the origins of it. Some people say it came from the Storyville era where women were already wearing short skirts and they would come out on Mardi Gras, they were already transgressing, and so they did. We have another origin story that there are uh, the Baptiste family um, in New Orleans. They started this because of the vaudeville tradition of the time, early, early 20th century, of calling baby, call, using n names of mama, papa, baby as terms of affection culturally for people who are your lovers. And so um, w women were dressing up in vaudeville as baby dolls. And so whether or not it came from the vaudeville, you know, Hollywood circuit of being a baby doll, or whether it had this story of the origin or some combination thereof, it's these group of people, men and women, who put on little short skirts with draws, as they used to say, <laughs> and showing your linen was a really big deal. And, and still the bloomers are the big thing. Now today we say bloomers and people will show their bloomers when they're in their costumes. But there are, there are a group of of, of African Americans who, in spite of Jim Crow oppression, created a sense of wonderment, fun, uh, attention to their own aesthetic, uh, to come out and compete against each other, because we're a very competitive culture. We're always one up, we always gotta one up somebody, mm -hmm. you know? And so they were competing with each other, these, these men and women, into who had the best costume, who could dance the best. Because walking ratty was a kind of dance where you would walk, strut, and then you shake on down, right? Now today in bounce, we shake up. <laughs> but you know, yesterday we would shake on down. And so it's the group, and so it, went, it, 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 it um, was on the downward spiral along with all of our black masking traditions in the 60s because of the rise of black power, the destruction of certain staging grounds for African-American uh, Mardi Gras. Uh, but then after, right prior to Katrina, and after Katrina, there's been a resurgence in these, all of these traditions. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so my question had to do with the appropriation. Uh, before I ask that though, did I hear you all say you went to Durton's? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I wanted to say is how important is it when someone is appropriating to give acknowledgement and respect to the originator and I'm asking this because I'm thinking about music, for instance. Often when they talk to people like Mick Jagger and people from Great Britain, they'll say, well, how did you get your start? They always go back to the black musicians they follow. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when they ask American musicians, white yeah. musicians, they seem as though they think they came out of a vacuum. Yeah, you I know, think, so. I, think I, I appreciate your question. I think that has a lot to do with American culture and the hierarchy of slavery and the, and the whole 
idea that, that it was necessary in order to control a group of people you had to suppress, and you had to suppress their culture in order to keep them enslaved. That's part of it. Whereas people from other, especially the, the Brits and, and parts of Europe and all of that, they were acknowledging it because they were free to acknowledge it. Whereas in American culture, that was, you know, black music was called race music and, and it was, you know, subjugated to the lower echelons of the radio bands and all that sort of thing. So that's part of that. So it's, it's more of an American cultural phenomenon about the lack of acknowledgement of where cultures come from. And then people just don't know. And, and, and what I have been living with with this book is uh, the old African proverb that and I hope I get it straight, it's in my head. Um, until the lion writes its own stories, the story will always be told as that of the hunter. That's, that's the basis of it, I'm paraphrasing. And so now that more, we have more and more African American writers writing about our culture, we can tell the truth of it. Because I, I believe, and this is my belief, that a person of European descent is not going to fully understand the ins and outs or have the access to the people who can tell the true story. So appropriation sometimes is, is, is based upon where you live, whereas Mick Jagger, he did the, the, the blockbuster movie Get On Up. That was produced by Mick Jagger because he loved James Brown. But it's rare to find an American artist who will admit that you know, a lot of people don't understand that Elvis Presley, he did how much how much did he acknowledge that where he grew up in the Mississippi Delta was from the blues man? Some, but not too much. You know, so so that is I think it's an American construct uh, appropriation. And when we look at dance, any dance, any social dance that we do here in America is rooted in African American aesthetic. So African uh, or American culture is in its foundation, African-American culture. And we can trace all of our social dances here in America to Congo Square and Gola culture. So the ring shout and what's coming out of all of the dances coming out of Congo Square have fed everything that we do, social dance practice, um, the twist, for instance, or the Charleston, um, uh, all of hip hop movements are based in African American aesthetics. So it's um, it's a lot of not knowingness yeah. and not knowing that there's been appropriation for hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's a starting of the conversation that should have been going on forever and ever. That the foundation of what we're doing physically improvisation and isolation and multiple meter and groundedness and get down and apart playing and dancing. All of what we're doing socially, how we engage with each other on physical levels and social dancing is rooted in African American aesthetics. And then, uh, and then I gotta say this very quickly, uh, it's about money and, and who is controlling the money and who is controlling the media and the mediums. I'm sure everybody in this room can remember the Jackson 5. Well, they came out first, and they hit, and they blew up big. And then the next thing you know, within a year, the Osmonds came out. The Osmonds were singing on Andy Williams' show, because I know, because I watched it. And they were singing four-part harmony. They were singing Danny Boy and all the traditions from the canon. And the next thing you know, they've, they've gotten perms, and their hair is curly, and they've got platform shoes, and they're dancing like the Jackson 5. Like, what the what? It's like, well, you were on Andy Williams' show just a few months ago singing Danny Boy. What's up with that? Because, and also because you have to understand that a lot of white parents do not want African-American posters of, uh, in, of African-American children in their children's bedrooms. So that's all tied in with that. You know, I, I have to say that. So. Gentlemen. It, <laughs> so. Sorry, I almost knocked water over. Um, I have a question because I have one foot in both worlds here. I'm a seamstress, and so I sew for a mostly Caucasian group. And then I sew with some Mardi Gras Indians, and I second line with the, one of the uptown uh, integrated groups. And so quite often, I feel like when I'm with the Indians, 
they invite me, but I feel like I'm an interloper. I'm intruding because it's their moment and their time. And I, I guess my question is, how do you all perceive that? Because I embrace the culture, I love it. Yeah. I adore it, and I would much rather be a part of that than uh, Rex or yeah. Comas, sorry. So, so. Um, but how is that perceived? How is that received, I guess? I've not had any trouble, but I realize there probably is. Yeah, you feel, you feel the vibe. You feel sometimes, that vibe. Yeah, sometimes I, I can yeah. tell somebody doesn't want me there, and that's cool. I'll step back. Well, yes. well what it, the difference is, is that some people who enter into the culture want to appropriate it and change it and make it their own. There is a totally white brass band, and there's a totally white second line group. Um, it's about taking something and making it your own when it's not yours. It's stealing. And then there are people who belong, not you, but belong to certain second line groups. They get in and they want to change things because mm -hmm. they're bringing money to the system, right? And they, they start making little. Yeah. It dawns on a lot, though. Right. You enjoy it for what it is. You're not trying to insert yourself or your culture into it. You appreciate it. And that's probably why you embraced. Correct. Right? If you did it the other way, you would not be embraced. Yeah. We had somebody up front? Yeah. yeah this lady has been waiting for a, <laughs> been right waiting for a okay. long time. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to, this is my first time in New Orleans, and I just wanted to know uh, what your all's opinion of Treme the series was because it was an in-depth uh, awakening for me of New Orleans and especially the Chiefs and Second Line. Um, and I appreciate you know your montages at the beginning. And did you have any luck saving any of your negatives? I'm sorry. Did you have any luck saving any of your negatives from the storm? Yeah, I'm so. So sorry for your yeah. loss. You know. That's about but Treme. Uh, in terms of Treme, uh, I would say 83% uh, was, was, was correct. Um, the, the thing with, uh, what's his name again? Oh, um, the producer who produced The Wire. David Simon. David Simon, right. yeah. Thank you. Now, Treme wasn't The Wire, right? Right. And uh, well, check it out. So... Yeah. So um, what he did in Treme, what he tried to accomplish in Treme, New Orleans is, is, is so varied, the culture is so rich, and there's so much of it, that he touched upon a lot of things, but given the constraint of television and you know the series length, he could not go in depth in terms of a lot of the culture that exists in New Orleans. The only problem I had with Tremay, I think he spent too much time with the guy who was the radio DJ. Oh, God. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think that was too much time dedicated to him, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, other than that, you know, it, it was about 83%, so. Okay, this is secondhand information. Um, but I have heard in the Indian community that they brought in Hollywood designers, figured out how to design those suits, and then took them, you know, then designed them and, in, in, you know, not paying the people here who could construct the suits mm -hmm. and, you know, taking that knowledge and, you know, um, designing I those suits that. elsewhere. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Mm. Mm -hmm. Did they call you? No. Well, there you go. Not <laughs> right. That's sacred. Yes, it is sacred. Yeah. That's interesting. That's I didn't interesting. know that. Well, you, you go with who you know. Uh, time for about one more question. Okay. Well, my concept of uh, baby doll came from Tennessee Williams. Did he uh, appropriate that, or what? No, how I really that? wish I really wish that I could like make that connection. Um, but I think that the titillation idea of the little girl is writ large in all kinds of culture. The vir you know, having a virgin, you know, a man having a virgin, a man having a, a woman who's not as sophisticated. You know, I think that that is a fantasy that is, you know, why else would it be captured in popular culture, you know, way at the beginning of the, 
you know, at the beginning of the 20th century in film and, 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 and on stage. And so what he's doing is just, you know, talking about a fantasy that is true for many people in the exploitation of women uh, that occurs from that. Mm -hmm. he, he's pointing out a patriarchal culture. That's what the baby dolls do too. They are in their, in their uh, over-exaggeration of these little girl themes, even though they're worldly women, they're pointing out where patriarchy rears its head to devalue women. I think we're, we're out of time. Yes. Oh. Okay, we have a guess. Is there one. Tomorrow is Super Sunday. Tomorrow is Super Washington and LaSalle at 1 o'clock, and there will be a second line preceding the Masking Indians. So right. you'll so be able to see both. Two different both. cultures the Mardi Gras Indians and the Social Aid and Pleasure Clubs. So Washington and LaSalle streets at one o'clock. At one o'clock tomorrow. You see me with my hat turned backwards in the mix. You'll be there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was important. But you wouldn't have answered those questions. Yeah. Huh?